Well, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be. I am pastoral intern Colin, and welcome to Studying God's Word. So this week, we will be looking at the Gospel from Mark, the 10th chapter, starting on the 17th verse. And Jesus has a very interesting interaction, or actually a few interactions in here. Um, the first of which is with this rich man. And many questions come up, more than answers, I think, between this interaction between Jesus and this rich man. So we'll explore that. As well as Jesus interacting with his disciples. And again, it looks as though Jesus will give us more questions than answers. But also reassurance of grace. And then Jesus uh, has a further interaction with the disciple Peter. Uh, to kind of round out our gospel reading for today. So this is about Jesus um, interacting with God's people, interacting with his disciples, and propelling us into a little bit of deeper thinking about faith, about life, about who are we as God's people. And so let's dive in. So we're starting at verse 17 here. And Jesus is setting out on a journey, and this man runs up and kneels before him. And from context of the passage here, he would be considered a, a rich man. We don't know where his wealth is coming from because it just doesn't say. But um, this, this rich man is very much in conflict either with himself, with his values, with others' values, whatever that may be. And so he is looking to Jesus for answers. And so he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I feel like that's a question for all of us, especially in society today. The what must I do question. What must I do to accomplish this? What must I do to accomplish that? What must I do to get that promotion at work? What must I do to have a more stable family life? What must I do to be more fin financially secure? What must I do to have eternal life? So that's where that, that rich man is coming from here. And Jesus, in Jesus' style, answers the question with another question being very prophetic here. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. So he's kind of deflecting that um, thing, that he's deflecting that question there. Um. And so Jesus goes on, he says, you know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Jesus brings this, this guy kind of back into reality of here's, here's the values that we are called to obey to the best of our ability, knowing that we are sinful. That's what the commandments are about. So he brings it back into context here. He brings this man back into focus on, on, what, on what matters. And so Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing, go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had he had many possessions. So at the end of this interaction, uh, we can perceive this as the man, well, it says the man was grieving uh, at the thought of giving away all his possessions. But there's one part that I think a lot of us, including myself at times, um, tend to skirt over. 
and that's in verse 21. It says, Jesus looking at him, loved him. And then Jesus said these things. So Jesus never stopped loving this man from the point of starting this interaction to the end of this interaction. And I think the man, like many of us, tend to focus on the what should we do, what can we do what are we supposed to do and grieve over an answer to that question, especially if it's not something that we like. But after this interaction, Jesus then goes on to explain what he means. Because this interaction isn't about selling our possessions, getting rid of our possessions, making ourselves destitute in this life, per se. So Jesus, in verse 23, he proclaims how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And it says the disciples were perplexed at these words. Of course, we're going to be confused by them because it's like, well then what are we supposed to do? Again, with the what are we supposed to do question. And then Jesus went on. He said, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Um, then they asked, then, then who can be saved? I mean, technically speaking, we're all rich. To a certain to, to a certain degree. We all have a certain degree of wealth. And so Jesus said, For mortals it is impossible, but for God, for God, all, but not for God, for God all things are possible. Jesus isn't telling us to go sell our possessions. Jesus is not telling us that we won't get into heaven, what Jesus is telling us is that we have a loving God. We have Jesus who loves us. And we have, we have this God who is way bigger than we will ever know. And with God, everything is possible. With God, all of us are loved. With God, all of us are forgiven. With God, all of us are given grace. And that was the point of those two interactions together. Is we are given this example of being swallowed up into the possessions that we have. And then Jesus kind of breaks that apart and reminds us of the God who loves us, who cares for us, and who continues to forgive us every time we mess up. But apparently that wasn't good enough for the disciples because we, we pick up on verse 28 here. And it says that Peter began to say to Jesus, look, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left a house of brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news. Who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in, in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. So. Uh, Jesus is saying, he, he's almost saying like counteracting Peter here and saying, it's not that your, your um, dedication to the gospel doesn't matter because it does, first of all, but what we're saying here is that we're we're all on the same playing field. Yes, your dedication is great. Um, 
and your follow being a follower of the gospel and being willing to be persecuted for said gospel is great and you will enjoy that reward but let, let us not forget um the humbleness that the gospel is the equity that the gospel provides He's, he's saying, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Jesus is pretty much summarizing our faith here. That Jesus is calling us into relationship. Relationship with a God who loves us, a God who cares for us. It doesn't say... It never says people will be left out. It just says for those who are first will be last and those who are last will be first. Jesus is giving all people hope here. No matter how many possessions you have, no matter what your position is in life, Jesus is giving us hope. Because we have a God who loves us, who cares for us, who sent God's Son to us, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, continues to give us grace. Well, I hope that gives you um, some ideas to think about in your own Bible study. Um, this is a very rich text with many dimensions of it. And so, um, again, grace and peace to all of you out there as we continue to live into that grace of Jesus Christ as children of God. God bless.